Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Thank you. Um, my name is Sheila Dickinson. I'm the chair of the Women in Business for the British Chamber. And delighted to welcome you here this evening as a, a joint venture with our friends from the French Chamber. So welcome to you all and bonsoir. Um, first of all, what I'd like to do is to thank our um, corporate sponsors for the evening. That's uh, Mazars and also Bloomberg's for the wonderful uh, venue here this evening. Tonight's panel event, um, Women and Soft Power, explores how women can use soft power to succeed in the corporate world. The debate will focus around the research found in the very thought-provoking book, A Women's World, A Better World, by Muriel de saint Sauveur. I do hope I pronounced that correctly. I'm not sure about my French. <laughs> uh, who is actually one of our panelists this evening. Quick introduction to the panel members. Firstly, we've got Muriel herself. Uh, Muriel's been working for Mazars for 20 years. In 2011, she published her book, A Woman's World, A Better World, where she interviewed 100 women from 33 countries, asking them what they would change in the world if they had the power. Wouldn't we all? She has participated in many debates in many countries to promote women's empowerment. So we're delighted to have her with us this evening. Welcome, Muriel. Our second panelist is Joanna Hotong, founder and managing director of Kids Gallery. After a career in management consultancy, Joanna founded Kids Gallery inspired by her own love of the arts, her children, and a desire to see them express themselves through the arts and enjoy a more well-rounded education. Joanna will bring to the debate her own experiences as an entrepreneur uh, and on the work-life family balance. Welcome, Joanna. <laughs> Our third panelist, and I'm delighted, a male panelist here, is Nick Marsh, Managing Director of Harvey Nash. Nick joined Harvey Nash in 2002 and built and ran the executive search business as Global MD. The executive search business is now ranked as one of the leaders in Northern Europe and one of the top 10 in Europe, Middle East and Africa. I'm sure Nick can bring a different perspective to how both men and women operate in the corporate world. Welcome, Nick. We will have the opportunity for a, a Q&A session at the end of the debate, so please don't be shy and get your questions ready. So to kick off the evening, uh, I'd now like to hand you over to our moderator, a face I'm sure familiar to a lot of you, Angie Lau. Angie is the reporter for Bloomberg TV, covering business and economic news for viewers in Europe, Asia and the US, as well as Bloomberg UTV in India. So Angie, over to you. Bonjour, Madame et Monsieur. Hello, everybody. We are uh, in a very international city, aren't we? Uh, and I think it gives us a great perspective on not only uh, corporate environment here in Hong Kong, but really around the world. And I'm so pleased and honored and privileged to be moderating this very exciting evening tonight that we have in store for all of you. And I want to welcome all of you to Bloomberg and thank you so much for coming this evening. So what is soft power? Anybody want to give it a try to define it? You all know what it is. It's what you do in your everyday life. It's what you inherently know. It's what many women inherently know. It's what many men also inherently know. But uh, it's also something that uh, is not necessarily seen as a uh, you know, clear, defined skill set. But it is, isn't it? So what is soft power? Uh, it's a concept developed by Joseph Nye of Harvard University to describe the ability to attract and co-opt rather than coerce, use force, or give money as a means of persuasion. I, I think it also can be defined as you get more bees with honey. So I think, I think that... Uh, 
I think that we knew the definition of soft power much uh, earlier than when it was defined by this very smart man from Harvard. But I want to ask uh, the three of you, how would you define soft power? Now, Muriel, you wrote this primer that many of us have on our nightstands, in our bookshelves, A Women's World, A Better World. Uh, is soft power involved in this? Good evening. Bonsoir. Um, I won't tell you yes or no, of course. Um, one of the results um, I found in this book when I interviewed 100 women, I asked a man to read the book and to tell me what is surprising for you. And he said what surprised me that thanks to the book, I think that women are concerned by long term and humanity and men are concerned by short term and science. And roughly it was quite true. Does it mean that women are more uh, keen to do or to have soft power? I think what is soft power? Soft power for me is to embrace people to do something, is to convince you to do something instead of asking you to do it. And it is something that we need today in the world. It is not something new. I mean, it has always been the case in life that we need soft power. But what's happening today, governance of the world has changed. Um, digital revolution, it's a revolution. We, we haven't measured the impact of it yet. But the world is open. And as the world is open, we know everything. And as we know everything, we want to have people to embrace our effort, to, to give us passion to do things. And in a company or in a country, people want to be um, enthusiastic by the daily life, by things. So this is what I call soft power. And I don't say that women are better in soft power. I will say that soft power is a feminine value. And today, women are having feminine value more than men. But if we decide to educate differently the people, we could share some value with you. <laughs> so, do you, okay. So, for me, for me, it's not a question of men and women. Of course, today, women are educated to be women. But it's a question of values for me, not a question of men and women. And I'm very um, concerned by that because most of the time we say women are like that and men are like that. But I think we are brought up to be like that. So I can give you more and more yeah, information about yes. that. And if you could share your, uh, your, not only your thoughts, but your microphone with uh, <laughs> the lovely gentleman to your right. So that was that was soft power, wasn't it? Did I ask gently and kindly? Okay, but Nick, you uh, you actually use soft power in your everyday life and also your job. You are as a managing director at Harvey Nash, trying to convince chairmen and CEOs around the world to hire more women. How are you? Are you coercing them? Are you forcing them? Are you painting them into a right? Are you, a, are you, a, you know, a boxer that we don't know about, or are you using soft power? Um, I, I totally agree with Muriel. I don't think soft power is a, a women trait per se. I think it's a trait that women uh, exude in uh, greater, greater, great quantities. I think it's a skill set that men also utilize, and some of the best uh, leaders of companies or countries use soft power. America uses soft power to uh, get China to get North Korea off their case. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the art of coercion, the art of manipulation, the art of negotiation, the art of conversation. It is trying to get people to lead people down the garden path to, to, to where you want to get them to without telling them. And I think 
uh, as a headhunter, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of talk about the difference between men and women, and, and I think men typically have a much more directive style. Um, certainly, traditionally, they're much more a, a, a tell and do. Um, and I think there's a big, big program at the moment around companies want to balance out their boards, which is about balance. And, and at the moment, the biggest part of that it, it focuses on around gender. Uh, but it's not just that. It's also about diversity of thinking. And it's trying to get people with different mindsets to uh, share, de-risk, improve performance. Um, too many people have the same mindset, which might also mean too many men or all men typically might go down one particular path without anybody saying, hang on a second, let's think separately, let's think differently about this. How can we make a better decision? Um, and so companies have shown better performance because you have perhaps women and men and people with different social backgrounds and so on utilizing different styles of thinking. There's nothing wrong with people with hard power and soft power, but I think soft power is something that is very important uh, for CEOs and chairmen because they're trying to find balance on boards. Not this microphone. Do you get a lot of uh, feedback from your chairman and CEOs when you find you know, people that can be on their boards or at senior management levels? And can you give examples of soft power being used in the corporate world that you've heard? Um, funnily enough, actually, I was listening to uh, Charles Lee, uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange, talking about how they acquired the London Metal Exchange. Um, and everything that he talked about was around the art of negotiation, positioning, between what was a very old British institution that wasn't trying to sell itself at all, it was a members club, um, and the fact that Hong Kong Stock Exchange, who were clearly not a favored buyer, were uh, the best positioned organization to buy London Metal Exchange because they were really close. Um, but because of the fact that China was this massive opportunity for London Metal Exchange, um, but of course China was really scary to the people in London. Um, and the people in London didn't understand, and so he enabled uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange to be seen as a, an arbitrage between these two organizations, two countries, and he used a very clever degree of uh, soft skills to, to make the British sellers want to use the Hong Kong Exchange as the, as the hedge between the, the, the big opportunity that is China, but also the scary opportunity that's China. And I thought that was just one of the most extreme cases of um, nice manipulation or, or positioning or negotiations to, to make that happen, which I was very impressed with. Joanna, you started Kids Gallery uh, as a turning point for your life. Um, can you explain a little bit about your biography and tell us how you utilized the skill set that we now define as soft power? Well, for me personally, I um, worked in big organizations previously and then um, got married young and had my first child young, younger than I had planned to, and realized that I did not want to stay within the big corporate environment. And I'm talking a few years ago. My first daughter was born in 1992. And I have to say, people were not talking about diversity in 1992. Um, and I was in management consultancy, and there's a lot of traveling involved and long hours. And I wanted to spend that time with my child instead. So I did an MBA, and then I started Kids Gallery. And that's basically how I got onto the path of becoming an entrepreneur. It was half planning, half accidental. But I think in terms of soft power, it's critical for entrepreneurs to have soft power, because at the very beginning, you have to persuade people to buy into your crazy idea. You have nothing to offer them, really. The salary is no good. Um, the prospects could be zero. Um, and you, you really need these people to believe in you, and you need to work with them. And also, starting and growing a business requires a lot of flexibility. What you thought was a good idea today may not be a good idea, and you have to change it tomorrow. It's not like being in a big corporation where you can have long-term strategies. You really have to think on your feet you're firefighting every day. I think the only way that you can persuade people to join you on that journey is through, through soft power. 
I think coercion would just send them running for the hills. <laughs> well, that is a, a nice segue into what I'd like to discuss a little bit more, inspirational or aspirational leadership. Uh, Joanna, you've inspired because you've convinced people at a very basic level, as you said, <laughs> the prospects could be, and the salary is, you know, okay, to be kind. But, but um, you inspired, or did you help with aspirational leadership? You know, it's difficult when you're doing it. You don't think about it. You you sort you 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 do what you have to do. You know, you don't label. Um, your behavior. But I guess, yes, you have to make people believe in you if you are the owner or the founder of a business. And you have to make them see that there is a vision that you're all working towards. I guess that is inspiring. It's very difficult for them. You can't make them aspire to what is not yet there because they don't know. We don't know yet what is there. You know, mm -hmm. and you, of course, you know, you can, you can look at your numbers, you can look at your successes, at your failures, and see how you're doing. But it's very, very difficult. They can't aspire to be promoted to the next level because there might not be a next level yet. Right. So I think very much it is inspirational. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I learned very much from my mistakes as well. And, you know, often what I thought was a good idea would not turn out to be a good idea. And there were some people I could not inspire. Mm. Definitely. There were people along the way who I, couldn't, I could not inspire. There were others who I, I felt that I could. And I, my senior team, actually, most of them have been with me for at least 10 years. Um, so I feel like I have been able to create a very good core mm. of people who, you know, have responded well to that inspiration. We've actually learnt together how to grow a business. Muriel, how would you define, um, is there a difference between inspirational leadership and aspirational leadership? And what is that difference? Good question. I don't know if I will give you a definition. I will give you what I feel about these two. And I, I will answer yes. There are two definitions for me. You, you, you explain how you were inspirational. But I think that for me, inspiration is between someone and me. And it's like a role model. Everyone in the world, in life, needs a model. Men, women, you need to be, oh, I want to be like that. I want this kind of life. I want to be beautiful like this woman. I want to be strong like this guy. Many things like that. For me, it's inspiration. But Aspirational leader, I think that it is someone who gives you the idea that you can achieve this even if you haven't think about it. Go further, give you the wish of doing more than expected, give you the idea that you are stronger than you thought. And um, today, I, I, I told you before, I think there are two revolutions today. One is the digital one, and the other one is more women in the workplace. But it's also another revolution, is governance. And governance has changed because we know everything. We, we want more transparency. We want to know what's happening. And the leader is also somebody different. Because we can't agree with a leader who will tell, do that. We're going to discuss. We're going to be passionate or not. And so aspirational leader is someone who is managing a team today, giving patience to people, and trying to mix the skills of the person with the objectives of the firm. And if I look at Mazara, they, they, they have achieved something very um, interesting with me because I am passionate by women evolution, women empowerment, mm -hmm. and I said, I want to write a book. Imagine the look of my CEO. I want to write a book. This girl is crazy. And I explain why, and I convince them why I wanted to write the book. And the book finally mixed with the objective of the firm. So well, that's an aspirational leadership agreement that we had. 
And I have to do the same with my team. That's not the same, that inspiration. I had the pleasure of, of meeting Muriel and uh, uh, the panelists yesterday as we were preparing for this panel tonight. But uh, your, one of your staffers, Danny, told a very uh, telling story. She said that Muriel, every morning, makes a point of saying hello to each and every one of her staff. And she says, how are you? And then she waits because she really wants to hear your answer. And it's not, I'm fine, how are you? It's, no, really, how are you? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Why do you do that? Well, you work every day uh, with someone or with people who you haven't chosen sometimes. Uh, and your family and the people you are in love with stay behind. Try to do the best with this day and try to enjoy the day with people who feel okay with you. And if you're not good, you won't be a good professional in the day. So I want, I mean, the atmosphere of my environment is very important for me. But I think you also set the tone, right? I mean, as a leader in your team, yes, maybe, you're setting the tone. Maybe it's, your, it's my job or it's the job of leader to make the tone, as you said, and, and you know, someone I, I met in, in, we had some problem with a girl in, in, in Mazara, and um, I told her one day, she was the manager of a team, and she had some problem with the team, and I said, do you ask your people if they are happy? Why? That's not my job. We have things to do, and we do them. I said, no, it's not enough. Do you ask them if they are happy? And they will be much better with you and they will be more expert. So maybe it's naive to say that. I don't know. Maybe you feel it's obvious what I'm telling you. But I think it's part of our job as a manager. And Generation Y, believe me, we conducted a survey last year about Generation Y. They are expecting us to do that. Nick, what do you think in terms of inspirational and aspirational, aspirational. Um, what are the skill sets you think um, serve companies better? And what are the contributions that women can make when it comes to this leadership style? That's a hard question. <laughs> Save the best for last. Yeah, I'm <laughs> snuck in between these two inspirational women. Um, Look, my honest view about leadership is, is it's, it is about setting tone, it's about painting a vision and a future and a strategy that people can buy into. But it's also about creating followership. And if, if you look at any successful leader, they have people who absolutely passionately want to follow that person to the ends of the earth. Whether it's people who've got slightly questionable management style but who are geniuses like Steve Jobs, or whether, it, and people will absolutely go to the ends of the to the earth of, for that person, or, or whether they have a collective style which gives that culture and that business sustainability. Um, I think women have a unique talent because soft power is really the only way you can get people to do things uh, in the long term where they absolutely passionately want to do it and they want to be part of that, that trip. Women have that skill set naturally. It's just part of your natural makeup. It's a negotiation skill. It's a persuasion skill. There are, there are many men who have it as well, but not necessarily in the same, same volume. So, you know, just the abilities that women have naturally give you the ability to, to be successful in that soft power world. It's now just about believing mm. that you have the right to actually go and, go and make that happen, as, as you've done. Um, there are many women who are very successful CEOs, chairs. Um, they're just are not enough at the mm. next layer down. And what my company and other search businesses and other organizations are desperately trying to do is mm -hmm. to increase the number of women who can move from the mid-executive levels to the top executive levels, because there aren't enough. And there are lots of reasons for that, probably far too long to talk about them now, but, but the, the women who, who sit at that sort of mid, up, mid or upper mid or upper executive levels have absolutely the right skills and competencies and capabilities to go on and become successful CEOs or successful board directors. Part of it is belief. 
Part of it is having guys who are in the, the, the driving seat at that moment in time take, take a, a swivel look around and say, actually, I can do something about this and, and change the tables. Um, but all of those things, whether it's you or it's me or whether it's other, others, have the ability to change the dynamic and, and the skill sets that women have got give you a natural uh, leg up in terms of the ability to, to drive forward your own natural skills. But it's a hard issue, isn't it? Because you, as part of an um, executive search company, really, I mean, you're trying to convince CEOs and corporate leadership that all the women and you men out there as well, um, but this is the pipeline right here. Uh, and I see a handful of men, yeah. and thank you for being here, but you're probably going to move on ahead in the game of life. And many of the women that we see here tonight uh, want to be in that pipeline, ready to get to the next level, and then what happens? Muriel, what happens? When we looked at the bazaar, because this was uh, the start, um, there are 13,000 people all over the world, and we recruit 50% of men and 50% of women, so we were quite equal. There is a partnership in our group, and there are 780 partners. Among of them, uh, five years ago, there were 9% of women. And uh, I discovered that women were living between 30 and 35 years old not to go back home to join another company. So suddenly our CEO and our board realized that we were losing money, we were losing talented people, we were not attractive, many reasons. So they listened to me and I said, this is an issue and we need to work on that. Um, four years after, uh, we switched from nine to 14, it's not enough and I won't say I want 30 tomorrow because it's not like that. But this is one issue, and what we discovered is that um, it comes from men and women. It comes from the job because it's a service, professional service activity, and it's very consuming time, and uh, it's difficult to balance work life and private life, and this is an issue today. Many people said in Hong Kong it's less an issue because you have people at home to take care of your children, maybe. But in some European countries, it's very costly to have someone, so it's difficult. Um, it's an issue because what you have to do in your private life, women are still in charge of that in many European countries. And so parenthood is, an, is a question that we raise, typically in France. Um, and maybe sometimes women are not convinced that they can have the job because they don't ask for the job. They think that if they work well, we will give them the job. But if you don't ask for it, you will never get it. And we've been brought up to be good pupil, silent, nice, smiling, not, I want it. So nobody will give it to you. And that's part of our education and part of the business. And we know the business is quite tough for men and women. I mean, life is tough. So it's a part of uh, our education, which is also one of our weakness. So it's why at Mazar we decided to work on that, to organize coaching, mentoring. And when I travel, I try to understand in each country how people feel, because it depends also on your background, the culture, the education. But Joanna, you are in a very exciting um, position to be able to say that you chose your path and you've succeeded. Uh, you came from the corporate world. You had children, you had a family. What were some of the challenges that you saw that made you say goodbye to the corporate world? Exactly the issue that we're talking about here tonight, but you did something else with it. You're absolutely right, yes, I, as soon as I, got pregnant, I suddenly realized, wow, this is a complete game changer. Um, <laughs> I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but it, it, I don't know, it just didn't hit me until I suddenly realized I've got, I've got a 
kid on the way. And there's no way that I can keep up this schedule that I was on at that time, traveling and working ridiculous hours. And also having to, you know, discuss with my husband because he was saying, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I mean, he wasn't providing much advice. He just kept asking me what I was going to do about this. <laughs> um, and I think, I really do think for women, I agree with what Muriel was saying. You know, women actually do still take on most of the responsibility for the children, for running the house, for all, all that sort of thing is still done by women. And I, I often joke and say, I wish I had a wife. I really wish I had a wife. <laughs> My life would be so much easier if I had a wife. And I actually have a very supportive husband, so I shouldn't really say that. But I think women do have to um, take a lot more onto their plates and, and plan a lot more. And I realized that if I, you know, I was going to have this child, there was no way I was going to maintain that routine. And as I said, in 1992, I didn't think diversity had been invented yet. So um, <laughs> I didn't really have much choice. If I didn't want to do that kind of work, I would have to leave the company. And I must say, they did try and accommodate me. They offered me part-time, but you know, it wasn't really going to work very well. And I certainly felt that if I stayed part-time, I would not be progressing at all. I would get stuck in a part-time job that was sort of treading water, really. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. I love work. I wanted to have a career. I also wanted to have my family and see my children. And that's all of these things, I think, sort of conspired to... to um, to help me come up with my business plan for, for the business. And I had already decided to study for a part-time MBA. And in fact, it took me three years to get my MBA. And during that time, I had both of my children. And that was a fantastic time for me because I wasn't working, but I was still keeping my brain in gear, learning new things. Um, but also, I was able to spend a lot of time with my children. And in fact, my business plan was my final dissertation for my MBA, and that was the business plan for Kids Gallery. So I feel very, very fortunate that I have been able to actually combine my skills and you know, sort of turn them into a, a career path for myself. I think another point that I, that I want to pick up on what Muriel was saying was I think some industries lend themselves better to soft power as well. I, you know, particularly for women working in different kinds of industries. Obviously education, it's about children, or my, my business is about children. It's actually easier to be in that environment because although I was working a lot harder than I thought I would be, uh, running a startup, that was a bit of a shock to my system. I suddenly realized I actually had to work a lot harder. Um, my children could come to, to my schools and they actually benefited from that as well. So. For me, there's never been a clear distinction between my work and my family, actually. My life is all of it combined, and I can't really differentiate um, between them. So I think that particular industry has helped. If I had decided to do a, a different kind of business or start a different kind of business, I might not have found it so easy. That's a great example of how you found a solution for yourself, that these were the challenges in front of you, and you found by being an entrepreneur, a career that could help grow not only your skill set, but your core values as a wife, a mother, and a professional woman. So I want to ask you, Nick, how important and what advice would you give to all of us, really, um, of trying to find that right fit? Is it about, you know, crashing through the gates and saying, here I am, hire me, when there's some challenges and obstacles? Or is it about finding that right company that's a great fit, and how does one do that? Um, the, th the first thing I'd say is that um, the, the leaking pipeline of talent is a big issue for every company, um, without exception, really. And, you know, I spend a lot of my time talking to chairman and chief executives, and in the Fortune 500 group, um, the latest stat is that 50% of the CEOs have this issue. How do we get more women to more senior levels as one of their top three, top three issues, top three items on their things to do every day. So these people are desperately worried about how the hell they hang on to the women they've got in their companies and how they promote them. So don't think that it's just you thinking, how, the, you know, how am I going to make it? The people at the top, to be fair, they are mostly guys at the moment. Um, 
are desperately worried also about how they can help. The problem is a bit in the middle. So how do we, how do we bridge that gap? Um, the first thing is, I, and I totally agree, women, you have got to put yourselves forward more generically than, than typically you have done, whether that's down to confidence or belief in competencies and so on. Um, but men will typically volunteer themselves for an opportunity, the next level up, whatever, if they've got, depending on the time of day, 30% of the skill sets required for, <coughs> for, for that opportunity, right? Guys? <laughs> um, 60, okay. You're being modest. <laughs> um, typically, I would say that in, in my experience, and the experience of my colleagues, it's about 90% for women. You will exclude yourself from opportunities if you think, you know what, I can't do that. But I can do all of those, but I can't do that. And you go, you know what, I'll pass on this one. And a guy would have automatically said, yep, count me in. I've never, I've never been to Asia, or I'll, I'll come and do that, yep. Um, so it is my, so the first thing is mindset. You've got to change that mindset and go, you have the belief, you have the skills. You're better than most of the guys doing the same job that you're doing. Um, so, the second th so the first is belief. Secondly, look at the company you're in or, or, and say, well, actually, do I like this company? Is this a great company? And then try and use the soft power, soft skills that you've got and try and find ways to um, gain the skills that you want to, to move to the next level or go and find a sponsor in that company and, and say, well, ha hang on, I want to go and do this. How do I do it? That's what guys do. Um, but you're better at it. You've got this brilliant networking art and, and skill sets of getting persuasion and getting people to do things. Um, so it, it, I honestly do believe that it, it, it's around self-belief. And I think it's about men in, in the position of power um, starting to change it. And it's not typically the CEO. Um, and it's not typically the chair of a company. They, they have it as a major item. They've got to deal, deal with something about it. It's kind of a layer down, maybe two layers down. And that's where the, 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 the issue is. I'd like to open it up to the audience. Uh, I'm sure a lot of um, people want to hear from our panelists about this issue, not only corporate-wide, but maybe in your own companies. And I'd like to uh, open it up now and see um, if we can answer any of your questions, because really, we're here for you. I mean, our goal tonight really is to help grow all of you to your next position of power so that uh, you inspire the next generation. So, please. I have a, um, a comment and a, a question. I, was, I have a regional role, and I was in India a few weeks ago. And on our, I work for a bank, and on our trading floor, I noticed there, there is predominantly men, and there's one team that is completely men. And I was talking to the leader of the team and said, why, do you, why, do, why aren't there any women? Um, in your team and he said well I never get shown the CVs and my question was what well, do you ask for them do you deliberately say to your headhunters I want a w I would like to see CVs from women and he went oh no I've never asked that so I think that's a lesson for you know for a lot of people here is you know challenge people when they say oh, I can't find I can't find the women I don't think there are any well do you actually ask to see them and that's really important and um, a question for a particularly um, you, Nick, and uh, Muriel, um, unconscious bias, do, have you, is that something that you, you find um, companies now, or in, in the case of Mazars, do you, have you got a, a, a program that focuses on unconscious bias, and by that it, it's about men and women um, having, you know, just going with type when they're recruiting? Yes, we have a program. Um, we have a global strategy about uh, two issues, um, gender parity and management of the differences. Um, for me, women are not in diversity because we are half of the world and you may be men or women. So that's one issue. Another issue will be to manage the differences, whatever are the differences and that's the global positioning, and then we explain to countries how to implement, and we let the country to choose how to implement. So there is a bottom line, but 
it's up to the country to choose how to do it because it's a cultural point. And diversity, of course, is different depending on the country. And I won't talk to India like I will do to Germany. So that's a global program and we have an um, action plan like tools that we can use. We have a, a written guides about different issues like maternity leave, parenthood, uh, women network and that we can distribute all over the world. And the trip I do um, in countries is also a good opportunity to discuss with the staff and to understand how they feel because they will never tell me like that in a corridor. I'm the boss coming from the headquarters, so okay, I would be uh, politically correct. Then if I organize debate, if I try to meet the people, they will share with me uh, how they feel and uh, what is the issue in the country. So that's what we do at Mazara. And it's a long-term job because uh, um, sexism is something that you don't notice immediately, that you can feel behind the behavior of people. Uh, women sometimes don't want to be seen as women because they don't want to be helped. Ah, I can achieve like man. Some others want to be helped. So whatever you will do, someone will be against you. That's, you have to know it. So that's a long term, but well, I believe in it and uh, that's not an issue. Yes. <laughs> uh, there is definitely conscious and unconscious bias. I mean, the conscious bias is very straightforward. You know, I was doing some work for a Fortune 500 CEO. He wants to change the organization. It's too uh, non-diverse uh, uh, from previous experiences. He uh, knows that balance boards make far better performing teams and so on and so forth. And so he was looking at his new organization and suddenly went to talk to the president of India um, <clears throat> why is your management team all men? There are no women, really. Really? Um, and, and, and the same with China. I went to see a, a president of, the, of Asia Pacific for a client uh, with his HR director, woman. Uh, and he said, of 10 searches I've just recently commissioned and hired, there were no women on the shortlists. Why is that? There are no women. Really? Um, and, and of course, it's bullshit, right? So it, it's just that in the case of the India scenario, it was conscious bias. Uh, and in the case of the Asia Pacific scenario, it was just laziness, um, which is a circumstance you had in your, in your own company, right? Um, but then there's a the whole unconscious aspect, which is that people tend to recruit into their own companies, whether it's as a, in a management team or as an executive team, in their own image or people they like, or people they get along with. You know what, they're, like, they're our kind of guy, our kind of girl even, you know, but they're like us, we look like them, they get on, you know, so, and suddenly you look around and, and all of these people are the same. They could, they doesn't. <laughs> so, you have to break that. And the, so, so in the UK, and, and okay, there's a bit of a, an advert for, for our industry, so I apologize, but um, in the UK that was a big issue. Uh, the last 10 years has been a big push to use external search firms because external search firms can at least use a different competency framework to assess the kind of skill sets and, and, and so that's changed. So the women on boards in the UK has changed from 11% to 25%. Huge difference because of the focus, because of the, uh, the change of doing things and that 30% that club that was created in the UK has now come to Hong Kong. Hong Kong is still pretty bad, it's only 10% but it hasn't just launched so Hopefully that will change, but it is because people just recruit people they know and people they like, and so it's kind of conscious. And, and but it's it's bad. I, I recently did a story about 30% club launch here in Hong Kong, and I interviewed the chairman of Hang Seng Bank, and he said that, um, and he has uh, some women on the board, and he said um, it wasn't about going out and seeking. Uh, women specifically it was about meritocracy and when he looked at the candidates out there he saw that some of the best candidates were women and it was just very interesting comment in that do we need to push 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 for women 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 
because we're women or is it because we're good? <laughs> Do you think that all the men who are working are good? <laughs> is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> I think I will use a sentence of a very famous French lady who said, we will win the day where we will appoint at a very important post, position, a woman who will not be very good. <laughs> That's my sentence. Hi, Fraser Murray from Rock the Boat. Um, I would say in terms of your comment on that, there's an organization here in Asia who went out looking for um, a CIO role and decided to try and appoint a woman and the search firm came back with five men because they were readily available. So it was very easy for the search firm to find five men who could do that role. They had to work a damn sight harder to find the woman, but they found one. Apparently she's fantastic, and she found two women beneath her who were also fantastic. Um, so in that respect, sometimes it's just about looking harder to, to find the talent. What I did want to say was for, for the women here in terms of uh, thinking about how do you help yourself to get there. You, you mentioned earlier, Angie, about do you kick the door down and say, I'm here, you know, give me the job. I think part of it is making sure you're ready for the job, and many women maybe missed out in a, at an earlier stage in their career with comments, opportunities, and certainly um, our firm do talent development and executive coaching, and we find most of the executive coaching that goes to men are because men have asked for it. So in the way that Nick described, men say, I'd like a coach, I'd like to get on, I want that opportunity. So we find people who ask for mentors are mostly men, people who ask for uh, coaching, executive coaching externally are mostly men, and I would encourage women to get out there doesn't matter who you use, ask yourself you know, for a mentor, ask for a coaching, and become brilliant at networking is the third thing. Because if you're brilliant at networking, what Nick's saying is the people who get the jobs and network with people they know, if I ask Nick to go for a beer to discuss a work issue, it's no problem. If Angie asks Nick to go for a beer, you know, we wonder what Nick's, how he's taking that request. So many women will hold, <laughs> will, will hold back. He's going red already. But, but many women hold back on that, saying, well, I can't ask a guy for a beer. And part of it is saying, yes, ask them for a beer, discuss the issue, make the parameters absolutely clear that this is work, but don't be scared to network with people because that's often where the opportunities arise for you to understand more about how the business works, get yourself known, and if you combine that with getting a mentor, it can really help you get to the next level and the next level, and all of a sudden you're in the frame for some opportunities. Hello, my name is Quinn. Whenever I meet someone inspirational, I always want to ask this question. What advice would you give me to last me the rest of my life? I would ask all the panelists to answer this because this is what we're here for. Uh, but I also want to share, um, two years ago when I met Anson Chan, who inspires me, I asked her the same question. I made her think for a little while, and I want to share with you her answer because it really helped me. Her answer was, um, if, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing well. well. So over to you. What advice would you give me to, re to last me the rest of my life? Thank you. <laughs> OK, I'm going to jump in here. <laughs> um, I think this is a particular issue with women. I think women spend a lot of time making things perfect before they take the leap. Um, whatever it is, in fact, my, my older daughter is just, she's graduating from university next month, and she's looking for jobs now. And um, she's obsessed with having the perfect CV, and she obviously doesn't have much to put on it, because she hasn't done much. <laughs> But she's still obsessed with it being perfect. Is my photo perfect? Has I have any typos? Help me check it. And, I'm, you know, and I say to her, you are not going to get a job because you haven't actually sent this CV to anybody yet. <laughs> and I really think that, and also, you know, starting a business, a lot of the time you have to make things up as you go along. You really do. You have to say yes, take the plunge, and then go for it. And I, I do think that as a lesson for life, um, you know, this is something that I've found helpful for me. Yeah. Choose either side. Um, I kind of would follow. I, all I would say is that believe in yourself. Absolutely, passionately believe that you have the right. Change the balance. Don't wait for guys to go. They, they, they've only got 30%. They can go for it. I have to wait till I've got 90%. Don't. You know, get out there and just. If you if you want it, go for it. Don't don't wait. Something similar. I will say. 
And I want to always say that to my team. Nothing is impossible. If you want it, go for it. Nothing is impossible. And I could tell you, I wouldn't have dreamed to be in Hong Kong giving a debate about women. I was one month ago in Russia, in Irkutsk, in the Siberia. I was in Mexico. I couldn't have dreamed about that 10 years ago. So nothing is impossible. I'd like to uh, share my story. Um, I was raised to not show off, to not say, look at me, um, to do none of that. And in fact, you know, in, in an Asian culture, when I, you know, was very proud of getting, you know, an A on my paper, I would be publicly exposed for yeah, but it was a very easy test, or it wasn't that great publicly. It's just a very Asian thing. Um, and so I always thought hard work, diligence, and quiet determination would rule the day, and it did not. And I saw people who I felt I had achieved better than that person rise up before me, ahead of me, getting those assignments, getting that promotion. And I thought, what is going on here? And I was very privileged and lucky, I think, to take a executive leadership course through Asian American Journalists Association back in the States. And they said, everything that you thought you knew, you don't know. Forget that. This is how the real world works. This is how it's played. This is how office politics truly is, and you got to work it. So I rose my hand. I said, hello, this is me. I said, this is what I want. Are you going to give it to me? In fact, I'm the best person for this story, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. And I, within a year, I was promoted, and things have been going pretty good good sense. Um, so that's just a little example of, I think, embodying. Can I, can I add one? Because I, I love that story. <clears throat> um, Harvey Nash runs a women's directorship program with Hong Kong University Business School. Uh, and kind of going back to one of your comments, actually, which was um, there are 15 participants on this course. 80% of those are funded by their companies. Some are not. But those women had to go and speak to whoever it was and say, I want to go on this course. I want you to pay. I want you to put the money up. That took a degree of resolve for one or two of them, but, and, and these are senior people. So, but nonetheless, they, 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 they did it. And, and by doing that, uh, and this is literally the middle of a six-day course right now, um, one of those people has already been flagged up within their company as a potential main board uh, candidate because they put their hand up, said, I want to be, I believe. And whether it's ipso facto or whether it's that would have already happened or, or what have you, the coincidence that that individual feels absolutely inspired and, and empowered that there is something about cause and effect. So put your hand up. And there's a hand right there. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm fairly new to the whole concept of soft power. I'm really sorry I haven't read your book. But my understanding is that it's, it's not that you're, you're forceful, but it's more you coerce someone into a decision by kind of, of being more gentle rather than saying, this is what you should do. So how does that link with this idea that if you want to get anywhere, you have to kick the door down and you have to raise your hand and you have to say, hey, look at me. So how do you do that? and be soft and gentle at the same time. How do you find <laughs> the right balance? Because that's what I'd love to know. Thank you. Soft power doesn't mean that you are nice. <laughs> <laughs> soft power means that you have a, another way to uh, do things and to convince people. But you can raise your hand and convince people that you are the best one. So there's no opposition. Don't oppose them. Uh, I mean, it, maybe it's a, it's a quick view.
to think that hard power is to fight and soft power is to be nice. It's not exactly that, but it's another way to convince people and it's, it's also, I don't know why we're talking about soft power today because it's also, um, um, I mean, it's the, 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 the time, it is the environment uh, and because someone decided to create this concept. But I think today the world needs soft power for many reasons. Uh, I said digital environment, I said women, I said transparency, and all that change the situation of the world and the view of the people and the expectation you have. And what we need today is soft power, but maybe in one century we will say the contrary. I don't know. I think you said it brilliantly. <laughs> I think it's, I think you can get what you want, but you can be persistent and you can, you know, you don't have to do things with a loud voice and a, and a strong hand. I think you can be persistent and you can remind people that you're there. You can keep showing your competencies. You know, I think that's, I, and I do think women have to be more persistent sometimes. I, 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 you know, I think perhaps it takes longer, but, but you can actually, I think, attract more attention by being persistent and not necessarily being the loud mouth person as well because that can put people's backs up too yeah don't I mean it's literally the, it, you either say I want that job or I really want that job I would love that job how can I you know it's just a different style a different tone um, what, what skills do I need to do how can how could I get there so you're talking about um, you're talking about emotional uh, IQ EQ as well Right, the ability to meet somebody, to read that person, and to communicate with them in a way that they can respond to you. Do you feel like this is something that you do in your everyday life? And is this something that if I feel like I'm not very good at, is this a skill set that I can grow? Emotion. Um... That's funny, I was in India two months ago and uh, was giving mentoring to young women between 30 and 35 years old. And one of them said, I have an issue, I'm too emotional, I don't know how to deal with that. And I said, you're not too emotional. It's not bad to be emotional. And you have to learn how to use your emotion. So I think the fact is that men built the business world and used to leave their emotion at home with the family and with women, and go to work only for business. And now what is new is that women uh, have entered the, the workforce with family, emotion, friends, um, many things. The life came into the business. And it's new for men, but they will be pleased to show their emotion. They were not brought up like that. So now we need to show our emotion, but it's just because it was not the case before. And you don't have to show your emotion. You know, you have to understand what is the emotion you feel, why do you feel it, and how to use it. So maybe sometimes it's useful to cry, maybe sometimes it is not. This is a question you have to, to, to raise. And then you will answer, yes. I mean, it happened to me, I cried at the office. For, for good reason. Someone was telling me that I was lying. And it was unbearable for me. I mean, I was oh, like that, so I decided to react. And then finally, the following day, someone came to see me and said, excuse me, because I had a reaction, because I followed my feelings. So sometimes you had to do it. I'm about to cry. I have to follow that. <laughs> um, yeah, you can. I mean, look, a lot of people's styles are learned. You know, you learn how to respond in, in business and in, in, and in work. And and if you learn from people who don't use emotion, then then you know, or, or use hard power, then that's what you think is the way, the only way to do it. So you can use uh, different learning styles. Start to learn. I mean, w women are brilliant at emotional intelligence anyway. I mean, you have it as a natural gift. 
Um, men tend to typically find it much harder. I mean, not everybody has emotional um, zero in, in, their, in their lives. I mean, lots of blokes go around shouting. Um, just different type of emotion. So I, I, just, I just think that uh, EQ is, a, is a, a massively underused and underrated uh, skill set. I just want to add that I think also it's very much who you're communicating with. I do think women are good at thinking about who they're speaking to, and they don't behave the same with every single person that they're interacting with. I think they're quite good at, at knowing, okay, this person responds well to this type of communication, that other person responds well to a different type of communication, and women can actually be more chameleon-like in that way. I, you know, I do think men tend to be who they are with everyone. <laughs> it's their personality, and that's who they are, and they tend to be that way with everyone that they come into contact with. I think women can be a bit more flexible in that way. I think it means simple. <laughs> I would like to um, kind of wrap things up uh, with a quote from your book. Because I think that this um, is uh, just a fact that we need to understand so that we could move forward. There seems to be an absence of support, the weight of family responsibilities, exclusion from informal communication networks. We have seen it before. Women refuse to lose time after working hours in their company's quarters. An absence of the female model, too many senior executives ignore them. But I'd like to leave us all with this thought tonight, that we come from women who have fought the hard road before us. You, how you define yourself today is how we define women in the future. So I urge you all to thank our panelists tonight for helping inspire us to be better. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to invite Oriane Chenin, Executive Director of the French Chamber of Commerce, for some final words. Thank you very much, Angie. So I would like to thank first Mazar, who has this idea of this great event, and I think we all enjoy it. I would like to thank the Bridge Cham and the French Chamber. I think it's great to do a joint event. I would just like to say a few things. Huh? I wrote uh, some few elements, and I just would like to say that we have learned many things tonight. We know that women are concerned by long term, men are concerned by short term. Soft power is a feminine value, skills also used by men, but maybe in a much more directive style. More companies, thanks Nick to say that, want to balance their team to have more mindsets. But on the other hand, we have to be careful because they like to recruit someone that looks like you. We have to change that. Everyone needs a model. This is inspiration. What is aspirational? You can achieve something you didn't expect to be able to achieve. A company can be aspirational when they match the skills of their team with the objectives of the firm. It's important to remember that. Women have a unique talent. They naturally negotiate well and they have an ability to naturally success, be successful in soft power. You say, if you don't ask for it, you will never get it. Having more women at key positions is a key issue for companies as well, and we need to remember that. I like what you, what you say, Nick, when you say men will volunteer themselves if they have 30, 60 percent of the skills, 90% of women. So we exclude ourselves from opportunities. We exclude ourselves from opportunities. So we have to change our mindset. We have to use our soft skills. Emotion, we have to use them as the world is more and more emotional. And I will finish with two things. We need to ask for a mentor. We need to ask for a coach. We need to network ask for a beer. We don't, we, we need not to be scared to network for people. And as we are at Bloomberg and with the Bridge Champ tonight, I would like to finish and to quote Mrs. Thatcher. She said, if you want anything said, 
ask a man. If you want anything done, ask a woman. Thank you very much. All right, cocktails will be served. Let's network. <laughs>